be a guy that, on a very throwaway line in the Chautauqua Daily, said that he, okay, we're going to, this is for your grandchildren. That's just terrific. <laughs> I've been trying to write some stuff, so uh, this is much more. And much I've been more. trying to find some Oh, my God. At least I could be somewhat. Well, first and foremost, uh, tell me about Robert Jackson. Bob Jackson. Uh, the former justice. Yeah, former justice. Never knew him, uh, knew all about him, uh, mm -hmm. and you know certainly he was Jamestown's most favored son. I think probably, aside from uh, Lucille Ball, who's <laughs> the most famous citizen, come out of Jamestown. He was, uh, you know, he was a very, uh, he, he was a real force in the court. I mean, he was uh, at, the at his during his time. I think he would have been considered one of the preeminent sort of intellectuals on the court, and certainly one of the more activist uh, justices. I'm sorry, I never knew him. I mean, my father knew him. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a lot of people in Warren at that time knew him because uh, they'd sort of grown. It's about the same vintage. I mean, my father would now be well over 100, and I think Jackson would be well over 100 by this time. Uh, and he used to talk about uh, Bob as he, they knew him in, in those days. Uh, but I never met him, unfortunately. What your, would your parents do? Tell me about what your mom and dad. My father was, uh, they were both born in a little town called Tidiut, yes. which is down the Allegheny River. Uh, and the, the, the old one of the old family mans is still there. My father uh, was based in the oil business, as was his father. You know, a long line of uh, oil business. In fact, I think my, a couple of my great uncles were in at the very beginning, you know, shortly after the Drake well was drilled in, T in Titusville. Mm -hmm. And my dad was involved in the oil business all his life. He then, um, he was a newspaper man for a while. Um, before he got into the oil business, he actually owned a paper in Warren, uh, which was funded by the uh, the dries. In other words, that was a, there was a wet and dry. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were for prohibition, you were one way and the other. Anyway, he he ran the he ran the dry paper, yeah. and uh, which was interesting because later in life he used to have a martini before dinner every <laughs> night. Uh, my mother was really uh, came from a very well-to-do family in Tiddy, sort of ran the town. Sort of thing was Hunter. Dad then became the president of the bank in Warren. And spent a lot of time. He lived to be 98 and uh, died actually uh, not that long ago. In Lakewood. He was living in Lakewood at the time. Had my mother had died earlier. And he remarried um, a, a Jamestown girl who had been uh, who had been widowed and uh, they lived very happily for about 20 years after, about 15 years after after my mother died. Tidiot is where my great-grandfather, his name is Gus Peterson. Really? Yes. For heavens it came from. Yeah. It's amazing because not that you know it's a small town, so it's not that many people come from Tidiou. Right. We still go back. I mean, there's a beautiful old home that my mother's family had right on the river with a, a boathouse and a tennis court and so forth. And in fact, it's one of those sad stories because it's this huge old place, which uh, you know none of the family live there anymore, and it's just a question of what to do with it. Yeah. Nobody will buy it. Are you destined to be f involved in public service? Probably was. I mean, my father was very much involved. In fact, my father, uh, I can't remember what year this would have been, but he was definitely interested in, uh, in he, he was served on the state committee, Republican state committee, he was, he raised a lot of money in Warren County. And in those days, the congressional seat sort of rotated between Venango County and McKean County and Warren County. That was the congressional district at that mm -hmm. point. And so the McKean County had had it. It was Warren County's turn next to get the, when the fellow from McKean County uh, retired or died, I forgot which. So he, he was in line to get it. And I remember being at home, and I must have been 10 years old at the time, and Dad getting a call from Venango County saying it wasn't going to happen, uh, that they had gone with a guy named Leon Gavin, who, was, who ran the Chamber of Commerce in Venango County. He got the seat, and um, Dad never ran. So it was one of those. Uh, Was he bitter? He actually, in later life, he uh, he said it was just as well he'd never gotten into it. He was happy. In fact, he he originally advised me not to go into politics because he thought it was a you know sort of a, a lose lose situation. <laughs> so, but uh, the, so I suppose then then I I got into politics basically the same way he had. I mean, I was active in the local party and um, committeeman and did various things and that sort of thing. And then the first time I ever ran for office was to run for delegate to the. National Convention, mm -hmm. because the uh, the district for the delegates convention is exactly the same as the Congressional District, 
And then I ran for, um, I was a delegate to Pennsylvania's Constitutional Convention back in the early, late 50s, early 60s, something like that, and served on, served with Bill Scranton, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. and, uh, and James Michener was a good friend at those days. Jim yeah. Michener was a, was a delegate, and uh, we would meet with he and his wife, Mari, a lovely Chinese-American lady. And every Sunday night, we'd have a big session in Jim Michener's uh, apartment, talk about the big constitutional issues that we were dealing with uh, in uh, Harrisburg. No kidding. Mm -hmm. well, what's his background, Michener's? Michener was a strong Democrat. Uh, he actually did run for Congress as a Democrat in Bucks County. Uh, you know, you think of Michener, you, never, you hardly think of it. Was, he was a lifelong Pennsylvanian, even though he, he'd live in Alaska and he'd sure. live in, in Hawaii and Texas and he'd go wherever, <laughs> Iberia, I mean, he's lived everywhere. But his home was in, uh, was in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And he, uh, he actually <coughs> taught, I, I never I discovered this when one night we were talking about where he'd start out. He started out as a teacher, a master, we call him, at the Hill School, which is where I went to school. Mm -hmm. And I said, my God, when were you there? Well, he was before my time, but uh, but he'd been a master of the hill you know, before I got there. And he, uh, I don't know how he started, well, he started writing with uh, Tales of the South Pacific, which yeah. was his initiation into the Then he turned into an, an industry. You know. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Now, is he still alive? Jim Mishner died some years ago. Not He, he actually was interesting. Uh, he uh, had, I forgot what, how many killed him, but he was, this, he was this guy who said, no. I'm not going to do dialysis anymore. I mean, it was a kidney, renal problem. And he said, it's time for me to go. He was, he was 89 or 90, something mm -hmm. like that. And so he just stopped taking any medication and died. His wife, Mari, still alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you started off really in politics with this? With this, uh, uh, in the Constitutional Convention. And that was a, um, but I certainly, I mean, I decided then that I never wanted to be in the state legislature because, uh, you know, as you going to Harrisburg. Harrisburg is not my favorite city in the first place. <laughs> and uh, I have had enough time to observe the General Assembly and the way they operated. It was a much more, uh, you were not your own man. I mean, you know, in, those, in the General Assembly, I mean, you did what you were told by the, by the leadership of your party, and there was not a whole lot of independence involved. So I really didn't, never got too interested in that. And the only well, the reason I, after I guess I I used to work for a new process company, now the Blair Company. Mm -hmm. Left there when I was 32 and went back to law, went to law school at that point in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, got a law degree when I was 35. Came back to Warren and practiced law uh, in Warren with Knox Harper and a few other people. And uh, then I uh, decided I would go, uh, I started running for these things, I ran for the journalists, I ran for the Constitutional Amendment, did that. Constitutional Convention did that, those sorts of things. And then when Nixon resigned, I had been at the convention in 68, mm -hmm. which, uh, and uh, in fact, I remember being at that convention, that was a, a very anti-Vietnam sentiment there. Jane Fonda was down there mm -hmm. demonstrating and so forth. Uh, but I decided that I would, uh, I wrote Hugh Scott, who was then a, a senator from Pennsylvania, right. and said I'd love to be a part of a, trying to restore the Republican Party's uh, uh, credibility uh, with the Ford administration. And uh, through Hugh Scott's efforts, I got uh, appointed as general counsel at the Economic Development Administration in Washington. Served under Vinegar Ben Mizell, who was the Assistant Secretary sure. of, uh, of Economic Development. Had been a congressman, as a matter of fact, defeated. And so I was there for about two, a little over two years. <coughs> uh, and in fact, when uh, Jimmy Carter won the won the election over Ford. Uh, I remember that very well because I'd, I we were at a victory dinner, which turned out to be a wake uh, in <laughs> Washington. And this reporter came out and he said, "Well, how does it feel? You know, how you know, going to be going?" Back? He said, "Well, I, I I think I was I said to her, well, I'm really sorry to uh, we lost the election because uh, because I thought I." You know, I, I hadn't finished what I wanted to do and so forth, and I, I wanted to stay in Washington and work in the thing. Well, that quote showed up in the Washington Post. That almost killed my, my congressional career right then because, you know, it was used against me the first time I ran. I 
Here's a guy who wants to go to Congress because he wants to live in Washington. You know? yeah, yeah. But no. Even though the quote was right, I'm, I'm, I think I said, I'm sorry to be going home because I'd like to stay and finish the job. But yeah. you know, the only thing I quoted was, I'm sorry to be going home. So that almost, that, I remember showing that. First lesson of a sound bite, right? Just be very careful. <laughs> showed up, you know, three days before the election. <coughs> But then I went home and ran for Congress uh, and told Judy at the time that if uh, you know, it would be my one shot, right? we would give it our best shot. If we didn't make it, uh, that was going to be it. And uh, I think she was surprised. I, I think we were both surprised that we actually won because the incumbent had, uh, was a, you know, a, a very able politician. He'd been a state senator in Pennsylvania, but, and he'd, but he'd only been in one term. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you're vulnerable if you're only there one term. And it was a Republican-leaning district, right. even then. But this time it was a lot, much bigger than three counties. It was now 10, 12 counties. And uh, Joe Ammerman was a, was a good guy. I mean, we got along well. Uh, it was a pretty nasty campaign, as I, as I remember it. Uh, the thing, that probably the fortuitous thing for me and the, the unfortunate thing for him was that um, somewhere early on in the campaign he broke his hip. Mm. An automobile accident. He broke his hip. Spent about God, a month in the hospital. He was big, heavy, weighed over 300 pounds, uh, and he never really quite got his stride back. And I think that probably was the reason I got elected. That plus the fact that I, because I'd worked for Gerald Ford, uh, he came in to campaign for me and came to State College, which was of course the wow. the biggest uh, you know town and certainly the people. I mean, they considered anybody. From Warren, Pennsylvania, must be a real Rue or Hick or you know yeah. Neanderthal, whatever. I mean, I didn't have much credibility down there. But Jerry Ford came in to do a fundraising event for me and a, you know just give me visibility. Huge throngs because, uh, more importantly, because Gerald Ford was there. Gerald Ford happened to be a good friend of Coach Joe Paterno. Joe Paterno came oh my gosh. to this event, and well, Joe Paterno's. Uh, an icon, a god in, in Center County. And the fact that he stood, he'd, he'd never met me. And I, I spoke before he did. And then he got up and said, you know, I don't know Bill Clear. I just I first met him, but I've just been listening to him. He makes a lot of sense. I hope you people, you know, take a good hard look at him. He makes a lot of sense. He said that. He said that. <laughs> that probably meant more to me than, you know, in terms of my uh, electability than almost anything could have happened because sure. then I carry the center county in the election and never looked back. You've been that you were there under a lot of presidents, yeah. Ford, uh, and I knew Nixon. I mean, I've met Nixon several times. New Ford, new uh, everybody since then. I mean, uh, Jimmy Carter was, uh, did a lot of stuff. I mean, didn't know him that well, but I did know him. Um, then I knew Reagan quite well. Saw him a number of times, mm -hmm. and uh, then of course George Bush was. I was very close to George Bush. George Bush came in and campaigned in my district three times for me. Yeah. And, uh, just a super guy, just a really, really terrific guy. And then of course I knew Bill Clinton. Yes, quite well. <laughs> well it, it, I'm sure you've been following some of the uh, postscripts since you oh, yeah. left. And in fact, I was in Washington uh, last year. And they had this little report on independent counsel Robert Ray. Yes. Said there was no evidence to show that the first lady Hillary Rodham right. Clinton uh, was involved in a scheme to obtain 900 secret FBI, FBI files. And that uh, they weren't quite sure about this Craig Livingston. Mm -hmm. And as you were reading all of this, and quotes by Joseph Dugan, a Washington public affairs executive who worked in the Bush White House and is a plaintiff in the pending lawsuit. Right against Clinton uh, administration over the file gate matter. Here you were the chairman of the committee mm -hmm. and dealing directly with Hillary's counsel mm -hmm. and oh, several of them. Several I mean, yeah, of them. Yeah. And reading some of the stuff uh, by Mr. Ray. Mm -hmm. you read this from here sitting at Chautauqua. How do you react to all this? I of course I actually because I had been the chairman of the committee when this was all going on when the when he had sent his first report on Filegate over to uh, the three-judge panel, which dealt with it, uh, I got a call saying, but I'd like to see Bob Ray. So I went in, and we had a good hour and a half session. And I, you know, actually, I, 
I actually agreed with his conclusions. I mean, I had never found any evidence to suggest that the getting of the files was anything other than a colossal screw-up. I mean, that they really, I mean, uh, Marcisa and Craig Livingston were real lowlifes who really, you know, they were incompetent. I mean, if anything, they, they should never have been in the positions they were in. And I think that was the, mo the biggest criticism you could give to mm -hmm. them, that they actually put such a, a sort of a thug as Craig Livingston in, in charge of uh, White House security. I mean, he just was incompetent and, and an idiot. So I met with Ray and he went over the thing with him. Uh, he then told me, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to meet with him again as a matter of fact, because when I get back, because he's now delivered his travel office file. and. Uh, and again, I've been invited to sit down with him. I actually have the, the full report in here, which he's, they sent to me, showing why they did what they did. One interesting story there. Uh, I was convinced that, uh, uh, God, what's his name? The first White House counsel, uh, Bernie, Bernie Nussbaum. Bernie Nussbaum, Nussbaum, Nussbaum was, was the White House counsel. I was convinced that he had perjured himself mm -hmm. in front of my committee because he said, in a direct question for me, you know, how do you, who hired Craig Livingston? How did he get this job? He said, I have the faintest idea. Um, I had nothing to do with it. I, I don't know how he got in there. He's sitting at the same table, the witness table, with Craig Livingston. And they're not very <laughs> happy about it. He, uh, but, you know, we had, we found out later in the FBI files that we looked at that, in fact, he had been interviewed at the time, right after the administration came in, by an FBI agent who said, uh, how did Craig, you know, he was doing just a regular background check on Craig Livingston and belonged to a whole bunch of other people. How are they getting jobs and so forth? And at that point, Nussbaum, the guy's notes said, Nussbaum said, Hillary, it's Hillary's call. She wants him in and that's who's going that to, that's why he's getting the job. Yeah. So it was a direct conflict. And I asked Ray about this. I said, you know, the, the one thing, I said, I agree with you. I don't think the files were gotten for any malicious purpose. I, th I think they may have been used after they finally found what they had. Uh, they certainly read the dirt, uh, right. and these were raw files. But I said, uh, I really thought Nussbaum had, had purged himself, and Ray said, you're absolutely right. But, he said, I couldn't get him. And the reason he couldn't get him is because subsequent to this interview, a year later, I mean, this, this, this happened in March, the whole Filegate thing didn't happen until two years later. <coughs> Uh, subsequent to, the, to, this, to this guy interviewing him about Livingston and him saying Livingston was the guy, uh, Scalambrini was the agent's name, was a private pilot. He was out in uh, Leesburg with his plane and got hit in the head with a uh, propeller, spinning propeller, and it was never the same. Yeah. I mean, it, it just took away all his long-term memory totally. So when he was interviewed by Ray and his people, he had no recollection of ever interviewing Nussbaum. He had no recollection of taking any notes. He could not recall. And Ray said, I had no corroboration. I had no way I could corroborate, uh, you know, that there was, in fact, a disparity between these two things. And he said, I just didn't think I had enough to indict the guy. So hence, that's the basis for the statement. In a two-page statement, Mr. Ray said prosecutors found no evidence showing that former White House counsel Bernard Nussbaum lied to Congress about hiring the White House security. That's right. I mean, I wish he'd said, no, we could, you know, <laughs> could not corroborate it because he agreed that he said the guy lied to us. Now, on the, the travel office one, I was a little more, I mean, I said I think there was more to that because I frankly thought that Hillary had lied to us, not, not in person because she never appeared before the committee, but we gave her some interrogatories and she responded to the interrogatories. I've read them since several times, and she was very artful. I mean, she disclaimed any knowledge of anything, or said it was always I can't recall, or to the best of my knowledge, you know, I don't think so. I mean, it was never anything that you could narrow that. Ray agreed. He said that it's very, very, uh, and, and I think the report, which I've not seen yet, uh, all I've seen is the press reports, and they haven't seen it either because it's uh, it's basically under seal until the court releases it, which sure. probably won't be until after the election at this point. But in that, in that one, Ray agrees that he's, he said, I'm going to be much more critical because I think that was just a, an egregious uh, abuse of power because they really had, you know, they could have fired these people. Sure. Nothing would have kept them. I mean, they, they, you serve at the pleasure of the president if you serve in the White House. They could have fired him, but they didn't want to look bad. You know, yeah. They wanted to, they wanted to, so they trumped up charges against poor Billy Ray Dale and, uh, 
made him the, the fall guy and said that he was stealing money and all the rest of it, which was just an outrageous uh, abuse. And I think, I'm sure, because Ray told me that the, the reporter is going to be very, very critical of, of that whole episode. But again, um, you know, I don't think, that, no indictments are going to flow from that either. I should remind myself that we're doing this for your grandchildren. What was your role here? Explain a little bit your chairmanship and oh, what yeah. the oversight committee was. I served for 18 years in the Congress, and I served for 16 of those years in the minority. Mm -hmm. uh, and believe me, the majority is a lot more fun. <laughs> a lot more work, but a lot more fun. Um, so I, you know, by virtue of the fact that I was there a long time, and Congress is a place that runs by seniority. Uh, the longer you're there, the more clout you have, the more ability you have to make things happen. So the fact that I had been there as long as I had, uh, it was, no, by the, you know, it was no credit to my super abilities, but just the fact that I was a senior member of the committee. I became chairman of the what we called then the Government Reform and Oversight Committee, which was a committee that basically could look into every nook and cranny in the federal government. Our role was to do oversight. <coughs> we didn't have much legislative authority. We were not really, uh, we did have some. I mean, we had any anytime you wanted to create or abolish a department of government or change the way the government worked, we did that. But most importantly, our job was to do oversight, which is a hard work. It's slogging work. You got to do it. You got a lot of investigation and stuff. So we were the principal investigative committee of the Congress, and that was, you know, the the thing that I remember best is that, and the thing that I felt very strongly about, and I still do, is that there were a number of things that went on while I was the ranking senior Republican on the committee, not in the majority, I'm the minority member. Uh, we felt, for example, that Secretary of Commerce Brown, Ron Brown, uh, had a lot of stuff that needed to be answered for. I mean, he owned stock and various things that he had jurisdiction over, which he never divulged. A lot of things that were very, very shaky in terms of, of his uh, financial statements that he filed with the government. So we'd write him letters and ask him to come and answer questions or send us uh, documents and so forth. So, and he just stiffed us the whole time. Yeah and made it very clear that uh, he didn't have to do it, he wasn't going to do it. Uh, another example, Nussbaum sat in my office one day because we were trying to find out who were the people that were on Hillary Clinton's health care task force, which turned out to be this humongously big thing. And they just said, well, they're all federal employees, so no problem. Uh, because if you have a task force that has non-federal employees on it, you got to divulge who they are, and you got to publish it in the paper, and the, the meeting's got to be open to the people, and so on. So they just stiffed us all the way. And Nussbaum sat in my office, and I said, I'd really like to find out who these people are, and we, because we think we have a responsibility. And at the end of the day, he said, Congressman, I don't have to give you that information, and I'm not going to give you that information, and you can't make me give you that and he was absolutely right, because I could not subpoena. I did not have the subpoena power. Without the support of my chairman, who in those days was a guy named John Conyers, uh, I could get nowhere. Mm -hmm. So we never got that information. It finally came out as a result of some of these later lawsuits, uh, which were involved in court. But my feeling then and now is that whoever, whoever controls the Congress, if, for example, if, if the, as in, in that case, the Democrats controlled the White House, the Democrats controlled the Congress. The minority party had no ability to do effective oversight of what was going on in the executive branch. So my feeling then and now is that whoever, if, if the same parties control both the, the, both the executive branch and the legislative branch, then the minority in the legislative branch has to have the subpoena power independently of the majority to compel production of documents. But that's what the committee's job was. And obviously when we got into the majority and I became chairman, and Newt Gingrich was my, really got me there because I did jump over two people to get the chairmanship. Mm -hmm. um, we were classmates. We went, came to Congress the same year, so I've known him well for 20 years, 22 years now. Um, when I got to be the chairman, we then, you know, got a lot of it. I mean, then we could subpoena stuff. And I remember Ron Brown was fully quoted that. Uh, saying, because we really started to harass him then, we were going after him big time. And uh, because he'd been so, you know, he'd really been so arrogant in the way he dealt with it. And he was quoted as saying to somebody, God, he said, if I'd, I, if I'd known that the Republicans were going to get control of the Congress, I would have answered Klinger's letters a lot <laughs> earlier. <laughs> uh, 
but I found that you know that the two years I was in it was a hectic two years, but it was uh, we did that and but, you know the stuff that got the visibility and that got me on television and all of the rest of it was was scandal, and that's of course what media responds to and uh, is more interested in. Some of the stuff that I take greatest pride in uh, were some of the legislative things that we did in the committee uh, that you know you couldn't get on television to talk about for you know you couldn't buy your way onto television. The biggest bill I ever really got through, and it was sort of my initiative, and, and uh, uh, oh God, Senator Roth, Bill Roth from the Senate, carried it on the Senate side, was a government procurement reform, which we changed the way government, federal government, buys everything from toothpicks to paper clips to F-16s. I mean, we just basically got rid of a whole lot of red tape, simplified the whole process, and I think in the in the at the end of the day, we're going to save the government about 10 percent across the board on everything we buy. Took a, it was a lot of work to get that bill through. A lot of resistance on people who, were, who didn't want to change the way the system worked because they could work the system. Sure. Um, and uh, it, we, but we got it through, and you know it, it didn't make any kind of a splash. But it was probably in terms of long term much more significant than anything else we ever did. Again, tell your your grandkids what FileGate was. Filegate, good question. Uh, we were we were exploring why the travel office seven people who worked in the travel office in the White House were fired, were being fired. Mm -hmm. So we were, and we were now the majority. We were subpoenaing all kinds of documents. Uh, they resisted us, and we, I was, you know, they wouldn't even with the even with the subpoena power, they were resisting us. So I actually moved to cite. Then Jack Quinn was the, then the uh, White House counsel. I moved to cite him for contempt of court, or contempt of Congress, not the court. Congress rarely invoked to cite somebody for contempt of <laughs> Congress. Actually, we couldn't. We didn't know what to do if we'd actually cited him because we, the, the only time it had ever happened was back right after the Civil War, and they'd had they cited somebody for contempt of Congress and locked him up in the basement of the Capitol for three days. <laughs> I couldn't picture us locking poor old Jack Quinn up in the basement of the Capitol yeah. for three days, but. Finally, at the 11th hour, I mean, I'd actually had him cited for contempt in my committee, and I was prepared to go to the floor that afternoon to bring it to the floor of the Congress, and he would have been cited. I mean, we, we controlled the place. We were going to get cited. They suddenly dumped all this stuff. They just dumped us on all these documents. We went through the documents, and we found one interesting document, which said, uh, this was a, a thing, a memorandum signed by Bernard Nussbaum, who was then, the, at the time, was the White House counsel requisitioning from the FBI the file on Billy Ray Dale. The reason for the requisition on the paper was being conceived as being considered for access, White House access. Well, we knew that was total phony. He'd been fired. He'd been taken out of the White House in a truck because they, you know, he was never going to get back into the White House because they really, he was their fall guy. So why six months after he'd been fired were they requisitioning his FBI file we thought, I mean, that was very suspicious. We thought they're looking for dirt to try and, you know, get him. Uh, <coughs> well, so we talked to uh, Mr. Freeze, who was the FBI director. He was appalled. I mean, he had no idea how this had happened. He began looking into this business, discovered that it wasn't just, it wasn't just Billy Ray Dale's file that had gone, but there were, he, first of all, he said there were 18 other files that had been taken. Well, the thing just over a period of two weeks, it was it was a horrendous embarrassment to the FBI. I mean, they really were, they had egg all over their face. Because it turned out over 900 files had been sent over from the FBI Ugh. to the White House, just on this sort of, you know, routine kind of requisition. These files were raw data, unsubstantiated rumors, uh, you know, spiteful people being, you know, being quoted. I mean, none of them had been really refined. It turned out that almost well, all of them were um, people who had worked in the White House during the Ford and Reagan years. I mean, people like, uh, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, Duberstein, Ken Duberstein, uh, uh, the, the guy that was the, the head press guy and so forth. I mean, all of these people, well, and Jim Baker who was the Secretary of State at the, at the time. So there was a, you know, that raised a huge hue and cry. What are they doing with these files? And uh, as I say, I don't think they got them. I don't think it was. I don't think it was a deliberate act to get them. I mean, 
he had been told, Marcis had been told, find out who needs to be re-vetted. And so he just requisitioned everybody and uh, got this list from the Secret Service, which turned out to be an erroneous list. That was what Filegate was all about. Now, I do think that when they got him, they, it was like anything else. Well, this is pretty juicy stuff, and I'm sure Marcisa, in fact, who's, he tested. Who's Marcisa? He was the guy that had been detailed over to the White House from some other security, but Livingston had got him. He's a buddy of Livingstone's who was head of security. Mm -hmm. He brought Marcisa, and I'm sure Marcisa pawed through all this stuff and, was looking, and probably reported to Livingstone, but I don't think it was ever, you know, it was a deliberate, I don't think they ever used any of that material, particularly when we when we caught them in the act with their hands in the till, as it were. But, you know, the, what it said to me, and it still does, is that when they came in, and I think to this day, it is the most in, incompetent White House organization I've ever seen. I mean, and, and again, Hillary really was the person who put that together. She didn't trust anybody who'd been in the White House before she got there. She thought that anybody who was in that travel office was beholden to the Bushes. She didn't want anybody to have anything to do with the Bushes. The irony is that Billy Ray Taylor had voted for Bill Clinton. <laughs> he told me that. Uh, the second time around, though, he was actually running transportation for Bob Dole in the campaign. Yeah. He was just a bitter guy by that's, this point. But she, she really kicked everybody out. That was uh, they, even the people that the volunteers that uh, you know listened to messages or responded to uh, requests for photos and that sort of thing, got rid of them all. And they brought in a bunch of really incompetent people, many of whom could not pass muster to get a White House clearance because they, they had dope, uh, you know, convictions and various other uh, problems on their yeah. in their background. They couldn't get on the thing. I, you know, probably not no, the year before. I it was '96 in the summer '96. George Bush came to town and had a little private dinner. Just Jim Leach, myself, and three or four of them. And at that time, he, you know, he was he never said he never said anything about, about against the Clintons until very recently. When they, but he was just appalled. He just said, "I can't believe that they have trashed the White House the way they have." I mean, it's just such a. He, he was just so heart yeah. heartbroken that they had done to the to the majesty of the office mm -hmm. what they had done. That he, he he was just very very not bitter just anguished by what he felt had happened. And like, he was basically trying to find out from me and from Leach, you know, what was behind all this stuff. In your course of your investigation, did Vince Foster come up? The oh, very much so, yeah. yeah. We looked into that. Uh, again, that was, that was really before we got into power. Um, and I got to say that, you know, even though a lot of my colleagues in Congress were convinced uh, that there was, you know, that there was a murder. I mean, the, you know, the, the most outrageous rumor was that, and he may well have been, I, I don't know the truth, or he may well have, he was certainly very fond of Hillary, whether they ever, ever had anything going between them and such, but he was, he almost idolized her. But the rumor was that they were, you know, sh they were lovers, uh, that they met in a hotel in, in, in Roslyn, that uh, he got killed, he was wrapped in a, a rug and taken over to this park uh, and uh, was deposited out over there and, and you know, all the rest of it. And the Saudis were involved. I mean, it was just, you know, all kinds of wild rumors going on. Uh, he was a very depressed guy. And we really looked into this pretty, very thoroughly, I think, uh, several times. In fact, Newt had me undertake a whole new investigation because he was getting a lot of heat from the, sort of the right wing of the party to, you know, the, we got to nail him with this thing and they killed him. And we went, in fact, a guy named, I put Steve Schiff, who was a very solid uh, guy since died from New Mexico, member of Congress from New Mexico, and a former prosecutor, and he just reviewed everything. Couldn't find any credible evidence that there was a murder involved here. And uh, we so reported, and in fact, I was on 60 Minutes with Mike Wallace and uh, basically said that. Mm -hmm. um, and I got a lot of hate mail because people thought, you know, you're, co you're part of the cover-up. You're, you're now covering up. Uh, the fact that uh, Vince Foster was killed, but you know, I concluded that it was a sad case. I mean, the guy just was, he probably, he didn't really, you know, Washington can be a very, very tough town. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, once the, once the jackals get on your case, uh, press or 
political opponents or whatever, it can be a very, very nasty town. And I just don't think he was coming from Little Rock. He just didn't really appreciate that. And it finally drove him around the bend, and he killed himself. Who's the most respected congressman you met? Wow, a lot of, I think the, one of the brightest guys I know was a New York congressman. Uh, able, bright, left too soon. I wish he'd stayed until we got in the majority because he would have been chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. A guy named Barbara Conable. Uh, he's been here, yeah. Chautauqua. He's a lecture to his. He and his wife, uh, <coughs> just terrific. He was you know, just a towering figure, uh, in my view. Very strong and, and uh, he actually did the Social Security readjustment that we did that saved the system because Democrats didn't know what they were doing, and so he really kind of took charge of the commission that reformed the thing back in 84. Um, there are a lot of people that you really, you know, the thing about it is there's a lot of people who admire the Congress. Congress is basically full of very good people who are really doing their damnedest to make the country work. The, you know, the, the ab scam sorts of things and the the junk tears and so forth. That's a very small part of the overall picture. So Barbara was a terrific guy, a guy named Bill Frenzel, uh, Minnesota congressman I really admired a great deal. Millicent Fenwick uh, from New Jersey was uh, just, you know, she was smoked a corn cob <laughs> pipe. <laughs> She'd been editor of Vogue magazine. She'd done every, been where, everywhere, done everything. But just, uh, you know, she was sort of the conscience of the Congress. I mean, she would, or uh, certainly of our party, I and mean, sure. she would call us to account when she thought we were you know, picking on women too much or, you know, that we were not sensitive enough to certain issues, she would really call it. But, uh, you know, I, I would say that I have, uh, you know, just enormous respect for all of my former colleagues. Sure. Well, talk to me a little about the presidents you, you've met and what kind of people they were. Gerald Ford. Marvelous guy. Yeah. You know, he's, he, uh, he really did. Uh, he doesn't get enough credit for really getting us back on track after the Nixon, you know, he said our great national nightmare is over. Uh, and he really did a lot in those two years and, and came that close to getting elected in his own right. It was just, I remember, I remember seeing him come back. A bunch of us who were on, you know, in the administration went down to the White House to welcome him back on the, on the morning of the election day and he couldn't talk. He'd been, you know, he'd just been, he worked himself to death and then lost the election. And uh, it was a sad, sad thing. He did, uh, he got, he, he really got a bum rap to him. He was always said, well, J Jerry Ford can't walk upstairs and chew gum at the same time. And, you know, and he, he hit somebody with a golf ball once. And, you know, once you get, once the media gives you that image, that's what you live with. He came to State College, as I say, not once, but twice, uh, uh, later in my career, he came back. <coughs> and uh, we had this reception and around a swimming pool. And everybody said, and he's walking around the pool with his back to the pool, shaking hands with people, and edging ever closer <laughs> to the edge of the pool. And he's like, oh, God, the president's going to fall into the pool. He was by this time former president, yeah. but uh, he never did. He was a, but you know, the, the thing about Jerry Ford is that he was a man of the house. I mean, he, I, he never aspired to be president. He really didn't, uh, he did not seek the job. Right. It, was, it sought him. Uh, he would have, his, as he said, uh, to me, actually, uh, we were riding from point A to point B. He said, you know, all I really want to be was Speaker of the House. And uh, uh, I could have been if I'd stuck around. But, uh, and then we went to, uh, to Jimmy Carter. And uh, Jimmy Carter was a very private man. I mean, you never really said, I mean, the thing I always felt about Jimmy Carter was every time I'd see him, he'd be all this big, you know, sort of howdy doody smile. <laughs> the eyes never smiled. Yeah. I mean, you could just, you know, you can tell people that, that it's, there's a, there's a mask there. And it never came down. I mean, every time I ever dealt with him. And he was, he was very distrustful of the Congress, not just of Republicans. He really didn't trust the whole institution. And, uh, and he again brought in some really bad people. Frank Moore was the guy that ran his congressional uh, liaison office. They wanted to put in a new Department of Education. And uh, I'd never met Frank Moore, never, you know, nobody ever talked to me about the Department of Education. Uh, the vote is on, the bells have rung. I'm walking up the steps of the Capitol to go into the Capitol to vote. I mean, 
vote is called. It's 15 minutes to vote. Standing at the head of the stairs is Frank Moore, who now says, Bill, <laughs> never met me before, uh, can you help us out? I said, well, you know, it's the votes. <laughs> you might have, might have come, we might have talked about this earlier. I mean, I was a fre not a freshman, but I was a, a very junior member. Sure. So they didn't mess with me. But I think the thing that really appalled me was that uh, he said, well, Bill, you must need something in your district. Think big, think big. Can you help us out? I said, this conversation's over. And we uh, went in and voted against the Department of Education. They got it, but, uh, uh, but you know, that was, that was just appalling, sort of, the way they operated. Uh, and I don't, you know, Moore was a, was a jerk. I, I, Carter, I really do think, had, you know, had high ethics, good morals. He was, uh, you know, he was definitely uh, a detail man. I mean, he, he just looked, I mean, he was a, he didn't delegate very well. Uh, as opposed to Ronald Reagan, who yeah. delegated a lot, but Carter never delegated. I mean, he actually did the, you know, the classic thing: is he did the who was going to play tennis on the White House tennis courts from, uh, every morning. He would check who was playing tennis. And that, yeah, but uh, then we came to uh, ooh, Ronald Reagan, I guess. And uh, again, he was a very private man. I mean, uh, you never really got inside of him. He was a very affable. Uh, and I think his, his, his secret of his success was he was always underestimated. You know, he was a lot brighter than people ever gave him credit for. The media never really, movie actor, you know, like Don Zeno. And it was, you know, there had been some other movie actors that hadn't been quite as, uh, as a student, George Murphy, who was a senator and so forth. And uh, so he always got underestimated. Uh, and the thing, you know, he was not certainly not the biggest intellectual in the world, but he sure did have principles, and he really hung to them, and he didn't deviate. And he'd leave the small stuff to the other people, and I think that's what a president's supposed to do. You're supposed to set the tone, say, here's where I make my stand, and this is where I'm going to go, and <coughs> just keep going in, in that direction. And that's why you know, Margaret Thatcher thinks he's one of the greatest leaders of our generation, or of any generation, because he had, there weren't many, but the ones he had, boy, he didn't uh, go off and couple of great stories. I mean, he would, uh, the first time I met him was a, in a re-election campaign and we were uh, photo ops. We were all invited down and we each always got about 10 seconds to go in and sit at the desk mm -hmm. and uh, and get our picture taken. And, and so I go in and uh, the president says, Hi, Bill, come on in, sit down. He said, now, what we're going to do, he said, uh, he said, held up his paper. He said, you be showing me this paper and telling me what it's all about and I'll look as though I understand what you're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> and we laughed. They took the picture, and I was out of there. <laughs> but he was, he, the other time I remember very well was uh, uh, I had Punxsutawney in my uh, district, Punxsutawney Phil. Sure. So all of the, uh, the <laughs> people who run that operation down there came down to Washington. We, I'd arranged for a photo op for them to come in with a, Actually, the Secret Service wouldn't let us bring in Punxsutawney Phil for fear he'd give the president rabies or something. So they had a stuffed woodchuck, uh, groundhog, that they were going to bring in. A good friend of mine was then on the National Security Council, and he looked out the window in the West Wing uh, as, as this entourage was coming up the walk, and, and the, the, the groundhog people wear top hats, morning coats, right. and they're all that stuff. He said, my God, the president's died. He thought he was for undertakers coming <laughs> Couldn't figure out what they were doing with this stuffed animal, but we go into the into the uh, into the Oval Office, and uh, you know he, the president was just couldn't have been greater. I mean, he was just really nice. And we were supposed to have about a ten-second thing. He kept us there about ten minutes, and uh, was really uh, just very, very good. The, the other one was the Tom Mix Festival. There was a guy named Tom Mix who used to be a movie star, and yeah. I brought them in one point. Well, that went on for half an hour. He got so enthused about telling old stories about Hollywood. He'd known Tom Mix, okay, yeah, and yeah. he was he was regaling of these guys with stories about uh, Tom Mix, and the, the staff was trying to get, move us out of there because they had a whole bunch of other pictures they wanted yeah. to take. Uh, but he, you know, I, I, again, he was, he, was, he was a great storyteller, but, you, but he was also a movie star, and, right. and, you know, I think movie stars always have a bit of a, there's a there's a, there's a barrier there that you never quite get beyond. And so, and he was sort of bigger than life. 
Uh, George Bush is the one I've known best of right. all, and uh, I consider him a friend. He consider, I, mean, I think he uh, considers me a friend, and I, I don't know if you've read his book. Uh, okay. It's got a great, uh, uh, it's called uh, uh, All the Best, and it's uh, his letters that he wrote. And I wrote him a letter, uh, and I read the book, and I said, I just had to write you a letter. I read the book, this is tomorrow's book. And I said, but, you know, endless letters. And I said, you know, I was saving the notes that you sent me, the handwritten notes that you signed and everything. So this was going to be my legacy to my children. But you've watered the stock so bad. <laughs> I sent so many letters. That's probably not worth it. He wrote back a really funny note, you know, thank me for the <laughs> memories and so forth. But he was just, you know, absolutely unpretentious. I mean, uh, just a totally, I mean, I've been, you know, all the time he was vice president, I would see him quite often because we'd be dealing with various issues that he would be involved in. And he would always, you know, bring you in, sit down, and you'd just uh, shoot the breeze for a while, and then you'd get down to business. And, you know, you never felt the least bit that you were sort of in the presence of, uh, you know, yeah. of all this. Sorry, he was just a very down-to-earth, totally unpretentious guy. Uh, class guy, I mean, a very classy guy, no question about that. And Barbara's a very tougher lady than George is, actually, but uh, also totally down-to-earth and totally... You know, very clear in, in their view of things. See, he's got to be going. He's got to be going through hell now, though, because it's. Um, you know, he so wants this to, you know, for his son. Not even think for his legacy, but as much as he really wants his son to win. And it's. Uh, I know it's tearing him apart. And that's. Uh, let's see. Well, Bill Clinton. <laughs> let's see. Uh, Bill Clinton is probably, you know, the best politician of them all. I mean, you have to be. To have gone through, to have done what he's done yeah. and survive uh, is just a remarkable thing. He's also not, in my view, he's not had been a very good president, but he's been a superb politician. Uh, and I will tell you that in the times that I've been in his presence, he is, he is an, he has an overpowering personality. I mean, he, he, uh, he sort of grabs you by the arm and, and he listens to you. I mean, it's, uh, he, he really feels like, God, he, this guy really is taking in what I'm telling him. So he's, and Newt used to say this. He'd go down there to argue about the budget with the president. And he'd come back and say, wow, he said, you know, we were just policy wonking there all over the place. We were talking about we really got into it. And then he said, and then I walk out and say, but I didn't get anything. <laughs> and Clinton was that way. Uh, but even during the worst of times, when I was, you know, holding hearings and I was really on there, on their, their not good list. I mean, I was on their blacklist for sure. And a former guy named Mike Sinar, who was a Democratic congressman from Oklahoma, and who I'd served with, we came in together, and, and, and he had died of brain tumor. He'd actually been defeated uh, and was no longer in Congress. <coughs> good guy, and I'd been his ranking member on a number of subcommittees. He was very liberal, I was pretty conservative, but we got along. We were good friends, and so I was asked to do a eulogy at his funeral, which was held in that little Episcopal church right near Lafayette Square, near the White House. Yeah. And I, it was a bad, rainy day, I remember it very vividly. And of course, I'd sort of forgotten that the President, Mrs. Clinton, would be there because Mike had been a good supporter of that there. Uh, and I was going to give this eulogy, and it was right at the height. I mean, I was on television about every you know, Sunday talk shows, and, and we were subpoenaing them right and left. And, and the, the Mark Fabiani, who's back to now working for Gore, uh, was, you know, glitching at me all the time. I walked in, and I'm sitting in the front pew because I'm part of the service. Clintons walk in, sit down in the front pew. The president sort of looks around, sees me, goes, and smiles, and says, how you doing, Bill? Uh, I go up and I give the eulogy. I come up, and, and I actually he's moved the president. He's looking very moved, and he goes, like this. Hillary looks at me, if looks could have killed, I would have been dropped right in my tracks, <laughs> right there. I mean, she gave me no slack at all. And even most recently, we go to something called Christmas in Washington, which is filmed in the National Building Museum. And they came in, and he saw me and waved, and this was just this past Christmas. And he nudged her and pointed over at me. She looked, uh, and just like, really? <laughs> she still has no time for me at all. And I don't blame her. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we really pursued her. We're not very pleasant. You're not going to be invited to the cocktail party when she's doing a campaign. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they, are, they were, uh, 
they're they're a formidable couple, and uh, I think that they certainly have made a, a big impact. But I I'm sure that uh, and Flinton's not going to go. You know, I just I wish he would go away, but I don't think he's going to go away. Yeah. There was a uh, book. I witnessed the power of David Gergen, and he talks about uh, a fateful decision wherein Hillary basically chose not to disclose some information to the Washington Post, which then triggered oh, was Bruce Lindsay actually wrote mm -hmm. the letter to the Post and saying, in essence, we're not going to release anything, even though both the President and David Gergen thought it would be wise to, to release disclosures, which then led to the New York Times and the Newsweek getting involved. It to basically talk about the coverage intensified, uh, the drumbeat for independent counsel by it was uh, for an appointment mm -hmm. of independent counsel. Edward Fisk was then yeah, appointed, Bedford, yeah, and then of course he stepped well, down and Ken. Well, started. actually, yeah, the, the Republicans got got rid of him. That was a terrible mistake. Bob Fisk was a really class guy, Republican, mm -hmm. yeah. moderate, sort of the, the Rockefeller wing of the party, uh, but not you know, not tough enough for some of our right-wing friends. And uh, they got rid of Bob, and he was doing a hell of a job and would have given him a good report. And put, put in, but then Starr became, uh, came in. And uh, so I, you know, I was not allowed, because I was the head of the committee doing the investigation, and he was head of the, uh, he was the independent counsel. Uh, and we turned out we were both being invited to the same wedding one time. And, uh, in fact, like Barbara Olson, who's also written a book <laughs> called Hell to Pay by, about Hillary, uh, was being married to a guy named Ted Olson, who had been indicted when he was unfairly, I mean, he was uh, cited for contempt and so forth. Uh, anyway, they were getting married in a sort of a hilltop place, and, and uh, my staff said, Ken Starr's going to be there. You can't be seen having anything to do with Ken Starr, you know, because it would really Muddy, it would, it would muddy the waters. It would make it look as though we were in collusion, and we were, you know, we weren't uh, keeping an independent view and trying to be okay. So I said, okay, I won't see. And so we went to the wedding. Didn't see Ken Starr and his wife were not there. We'd met him several times before. And so we're leaving, and it was a big wedding, and there was this sort of country road going up the hill through the woods, and there were cars parked on both sides, and we had to walk all the way down the hill to get into our car. And... Uh, the wedding's going on. We're, I'm leaving early because I had to go to the press association dinner that night. I'm leaving early. Ken Starr's just arriving. He's late. So we meet. It was like a walk in the woods. I yeah. mean, Ken Starr and the chairman, me, the chairman of the committee, meet. And I said, I'm not supposed to talk to you. <laughs> he said, I know. So we talked. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was a good guy. He really was. He, he got, you know, chewed up in that process. And it was unbelievable because he's a very, very solid no question about it. Do you believe Gergen's? Uh, I probably do. Yeah, I think that be Hillary. She and and she still reflects that. I mean, she's a very very suspicious. There's a little paranoia there. She really doesn't. Uh, she doesn't want to divulge anything. I mean, it's, you know, that's why she brought Bernie Nussbaum in, uh, and who was a hell of a good lawyer, good New York, tough New York lawyer. Don't give him anything. I mean, stiff him all the way. That's great if you're representing a client. If you're representing the President of the United States, it may be great from a strategic point of view, but politically it's absolutely stupid to just say, we're not going to give anything to the media, we're not going to give anything to the, to the committees of Congress, we're not, you know, we're just going to stonewall. That was Hillary's call, and she liked the Bernie Nussbaum to be that tough. And I think that's what was reflected there. She just didn't want to, she didn't want to give away the, you know, she wouldn't give him anything, and still is very, very reserved in what she does. I mean, she's running a very conservative campaign. I mean, she doesn't, she doesn't expose herself. You haven't seen her on any talk shows. You haven't seen her on any, uh, you know, she doesn't do many interviews. She's a very, very private person. And I still think she, I'm really looking forward to reading this uh, Ray's report on this thing, because he tells me that it's going to be very critical of her. Probably won't come out until after the election, though. For obvious reasons, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gergen, I thought I was going to get him up here at Chautauqua this summer because he, he he heads up this thing called uh, Innovations in Government Panel, which the uh, Harvard and the uh, Ford Foundation fund, and I'm on the panel with him. He's the chairman of it, so I will see him. As a matter of fact, this coming month we we meet to review all the panels. He's a good guy, and I'd love to have him come back here. He's been here once. His brother was here. I didn't think his brother was a great lecturer, but uh, David would be a good good guy to have here. 
I'm sure Chautauqua uses your influences and your access to try to get some speakers up there. Yeah, and I haven't been very successful. I mean, they kept trying to get me to get Newt when Newt was the speaker, and I could never get him to come up here. I now could maybe appreciate why. I mean, the main reason, the main argument I used to get to try and get Newt to come up was because Marianne, his then wife, had worked at the Athenaeum. Huh. And she wanted to come back, and she was very eager to come up. And Newt always resisted that. Well, it turned out they were going through. <laughs> <laughs> now you know. Now I know why I maybe didn't want to come up here with Mary Ann. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've had some uh, luck. And although, you know, lately we haven't had many political figures. I think uh, next summer a guy named Bill Thomas is a very good friend. And if we hold the majority, is probably going to be chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. I think he's agreed he will come up and they would like to have him here. And uh, there will probably be a few others that we might get if we keep control. Do you miss it? Sure, you do. Um, you feel you, you know you're in the loop, uh, and you know I, over the 18 years, I, Judy and I were just I was speculating about what I would talk to you about, and uh, you know we met. You know, it's every major leader in the world. I mean, from uh, uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Chirac, all the presidents here. I met Mandela. I met uh, King Hussein. I met uh, Sadat before he was killed. Uh, met all those old commies, Yanis Kadar in Hungary, and uh, uh, the head of, I remember being in a session with, I can't remember his name, but the guy who was president of East Germany at the time, and who put up the wall. And I remember we had a little meeting with him, and, and at one point, a uh, guy, Vanderjag, who was a congressman, was on the trip, and he said, uh, Mr. President, why don't you just take down the wall, you know? <laughs> at this point, this guy, Werner, was it Werner Erhard or something like that? Anyway, he get guy gets up and walks out of the room and we are practically run out of the country really? <laughs> because of it. He didn't take that because he put up the wall and yeah. he was not about to take it down. So we, you know, I've met a lot of very uh, big people, Russian, when Soviets were there, I was, in, I was in the Soviet Union three times while I was still in the Soviet Union, I've been back once since it's been a brighter country. Uh, yeah, and you miss, you know, that's kind of exciting stuff and you really do feel that you're, you're having a hand in it. What I didn't miss was uh, what I don't miss is uh, you know running through the Pittsburgh airport every uh, every week yeah. weekend uh, you know being s you know you, you don't lead a very normal life as a member of Congress you spend four or five days in Washington three days in your district and it's sort of an endless routine um, I used to envy my uh, my urban colleagues because they would have one Chamber of Commerce uh, one Republican Party the organization, one alliance club. I had, at the end, I had 14 counties in my district. So I went to 14 Lincoln Day dinners and 14 Chamber of Commerce dinners, and and you know, y you enjoy it, but it gets a little, you know, it gets a little wearing after a while. After 18 years, it got wearing, and uh, and then I, you know, I felt when I left in '97 that, uh, you know, I. I I'd gotten my procurement reform bill through. I'd gotten the uh, unfunded mandates bill through, which was part of my deal. We'd gotten the uh, line and a veto through, which has since been, of course, since thrown out. Uh, but I was real proud of those uh, those pieces of legislation. And I said, what do you do for an encore? You know, I, mean, I didn't really have any other legislative uh, things I wanted to do. And frankly, you know, that, that those two years I spent were so high. <laughs> So high pressure that I was I was sort of burned out by that time. I mean, I'd really, uh, you know, you're working 18 hours a day, day in and day out, and, and the stress of, you know, what are the Democrats going to do when you hold this hearing, you know, how, uh, you know, what tricks have they got up their sleeve to make your life miserable? And they had a lot of tricks. I mean, they would, <coughs> they would pull everyone in the booth. They'd walk out on me, um, you know, take the, and they'd get into high dudgeon and say, you're being, you know, you're being. Uh, Nazi-like or you're fascist and we're going to walk out. I mean, they were very, not very pleasant. And, you know, you sort of understood because they'd been in power for 40 years. Yeah. They couldn't really accept the fact that uh, they were no longer in power. They just, they were in denial and they didn't want to, they, so they gave you no slack at all. So I was a little burned out at yeah. the time of that. Nowadays, I mean, I can sit here in Chautauqua and, and observe the passing parade and and still feel I'm, you know, I, because I, you can't get away. I mean, I've subscribed to Roll Call, for example, that I get every twice, three times a week. I keep pretty close to it. You keep contact with some of your former Oh, colleagues? yeah. My, Bill Thomas, I say, is a very close friend. Uh, Bob Livingston, who's 
you know, was going to be the speaker is a, a very close friend. He's gone now. He's making a lot of money as a lobbyist in Washington. Um, you know, there are a number of guys that, and girls. Nancy Johnson's a good friend. Uh, I'm still very uh, close to the Ripon Society, which I was chairman of for a number of years, and uh, probably will be going on a trip with them in November to uh, Rome. Great. So I, I do keep uh, pretty close to him. No, Rick Lazio very well, and uh, hope that he wins because he is uh, he was on my committee, and, and a very uh, very good guy. I think mean, he's getting in. You know, the only problem is he looks too young. You know, he doesn't <laughs> quite doesn't look senatorial yet, but he'd be a good one. He'd be yeah. an excellent senator if he gets in. Good, and he fits New York well. He's a, a moderate, you know, solid guy, and very effective. He he was our lead guy on housing issues. As a matter of fact. Sure. Mm -hmm. Any regrets while you were there? That things that you wish you'd done differently. Ridiculous. Probably are. I mean, I, I, as I said when I left, that uh, I uh, I was. Uh, I was smart enough to know, or I mean, I was wise enough to know that I made a lot of mistakes, made a lot of errors when I was in Congress. Mm -hmm. But I was politic enough to know that I'd for forgotten them all, yeah. <laughs> that I couldn't remember them anymore. But I'm sure that, uh, you know, there were some times when I would be uh, exasperated with uh, something going in. So, I mean, I, I don't often lose my cool, but there are a couple of times when I did, which I probably shouldn't have. Uh, but, and I think that uh, I was, I mean, a dull subject, but the, thing that I worked on for probably the whole time I was there and could never get it through. Very dull subject. Why doesn't the federal government have a capital budget, as does every state, as sure. does every corporation? Why do we treat everything as though it's the same? I mean, why should you say that something that you're putting into a dam or into a, a building or whatever is going to be treated the same as, as, a, as a transfer payment to, to run the government? I mean, you have no idea. You know, you can't <coughs> figure out what your investments are versus what your what it costs to run the government. And uh, I, my, to my great, you know, I mean, I'm really disappointed we never got that off the ground. I got a little something in at one point. There's now a special schedule that comes in the federal budget where they have to show something, but it's not the same as a federal as a federal capital budget. And I had a, you know, we were, we were really working on the thing. Bob Edgar, who was a former member from uh, Democrat from Pennsylvania, and ran for the Senate down there. <coughs> Matter of fact, took Joan Brown Campbell's place as head of the National Council of sure. Churches when uh, she left. Um, and we worked the issue, and we never never got there because uh, OMB, Office of Management and Budget, which is the sort of the, the fiscal watchdog of the executive branch, no director ever would give me any house room. From David Stockman, who had been a colleague in the House and was there, and uh, uh, oh, yeah, uh, 